Dan Ball, how are we doing? Oh my, what an honor it is to be here with you, man! I'm happy to have you here. It's been a, it's been a few years since I've obviously I've heard your name, and the, I heard yours first. Oh, you did? Okay, that that's that's touching. I appreciate <laughs> that. But um, I've heard your name through the grapevine from Big Joe from uh, Impact Goalkeeper Academy, and he was telling me he's like, man, there's this guy from Iowa State. He's he's the next level. He's the real thing, and um, it's not a surprise to me and for everyone that's not you know not aware of where you are, Angel City calls, and that's where you are now. So take me through the first season with Angel City. Um, we'll talk about maybe just you guys selling out every week and what was that experience like? Uh, yeah, it's been an, uh, an incredible year and three months uh, since that journey started. I got a, a phone call and it was, would you like to interview to come to Angel City? And then really quickly, February rolled around and we was in preseason at Pepperdine and I'd gone from uh, Iowa to New Jersey to Malibu. I'm standing in Malibu and uh, our team is incredible. Um, we had uh, we did our preseason camp there and then went down to Chula Vista, played against San Diego. And before I knew it, we were, were in front of 10,000 people at Cal State Fullerton. That was, that was legit. And then we really quickly found ourselves at the bank in front of 22,000 people uh, against North Carolina, who had been an NWSL powerhouse. Uh, we knew that it would be a big, big challenge and managed to find our way uh, to a 2-1 win in front of um, a packed Bank of California. Uh, mm. This year, we were um, really, really fortunate to have an incredible fan base that we averaged, I think, just over 19,000 people, wow. uh, which is unprecedented and an incredible environment for our women to play, for us to coach and for our fans to support. So um, we finished the year just outside the playoffs, kind of shot ourselves in the foot a little bit, but mm. Uh, had some injuries that made things tough along the way, but really, really proud of our women and our staff, uh, what we managed to accomplish. The people that are operating the front office have done an incredible brand and an incredible job yeah. in building the brand that is Angel City. So take me through, obviously, you guys are selling out these games mm -hmm. and not, maybe not a surprise for us here in LA and the mm -hmm. LAFC fan base that yeah, yeah. you guys are probably, you know, those those fans would transition to that as yeah. well. Um but I think your your parents, I think, were, they came to how many games a season? They, my mum come to four games my whole family was at the first game which is kind of crazy because I started playing soccer when I was 13 okay uh, my parents never come to a game while I was in England um and to have my whole family set, set up in the corner of uh, the bank full to the rafters <laughs> um watching me for 25 minutes kick a ball at um Dee, Dee and Britt and Meyer at the time was will go down as like one of the greatest moments of my life to wow. date and your parents, what were their, I mean, did they have any expectations for what they were walking into? <laughs> um, when I took the job at Iowa State and having left Bowling Green, I sent my dad a picture of um, Jack Tri Stadium, which is where the football team play. And mm -hmm. that's how I was marking the size of the score. My dad was like, this is massive. Um, and then I went to Gotham. They didn't get to come and watch a game at Gotham. COVID was uh, like obviously a, a blight on the country so they couldn't get into the country but I'd sent them pictures of what the bank was going to be like but I didn't have anything Angel City-esque because mm -hmm. it was the first game so after after the game we won 2-1 we was down in um, like the executive suite for a big party a big celebration and the look on my family's faces my mum my dad my sister my auntie my girlfriend uh, her sister were all there um there is nothing to compare it to in the world. And that's why this year has been an incredible privilege to, to work with the women that we get to work with, to kind of lay a new pathway for what women's soccer can look like in this country. And you share with me a little bit, your, your parents, there was not a, not a buy-in, but also knowing you and knowing your academic pursuits as well and your master's and is master's in science and master's in business. Very, wow. Of course, I do my research mm -hmm. here. And so, I mean, someone with that academic track record and someone I'm speaking to you, you know, through coffee and through the phone and all that. I, you're a very smart guy, very, very articulate of what you, you do. Mate. So do your parents feel as though the journey that you've taken, maybe that uh, the smarts are, are best used maybe somewhere else in the business world? Listen, in 2015, I graduated from a really good school in East Tennessee where lots of people knew what their occupational direction was going to be, right? They wanted to be a doctor, wanted to go be a pastor, I wanted to be a physical therapist and I didn't really have any occupational direction. So I kind of fell into coaching. Um, my dad has a, a pretty good job back home. He works for a pretty big company and um, what he's done over the last 25 years of my life has afforded my sister and I this incredible way of living. And thus when I found my way into coaching, 
I think it's fair to say they struggled. They mm. struggled with with what that looked like. Um, would I be able to afford the people that I'm going to bring into the world, the lifestyle that I was afforded? Um, would I be able to afford to get home to see them? You know, obviously they're the other side of the world and we want to continue that familial relationship, yeah. but that costs money, of course, right? And my first couple of jobs, I, I didn't get paid anything. Um, so for my parents to sit at the bank, having missed a couple of the steps along the way, they never got to come and see, uh, you know, us at Bowling Green. They never got to come and see Iowa State. They never got to see Jersey and Gotham. So their last experience of me in this country involved in soccer was at Milligan in 2015 they came. Um, so there's a large part of the story that's kind of, it's not filled in. It's like yeah. go from chapter one to chapter four. Um, and chapter four was pretty epic. <laughs> it was like, uh, you know, emboldened and underlined and chapter one was pretty small and nondescript and I'm really, really grateful for it. But there's a lot for them that doesn't really make sense and it doesn't make sense still. Um, but watching my mum, you know, I get messages from, from my mum once a week that is the score, who scored. Mm -hmm. She'll send me a video of Didi's save. Oh, Brit's playing. Oh, Almy's played. Um, my parents are invested in this journey now in a way that if you'd have asked me 18 months ago, I couldn't have really foreseen but it's brought us closer together. There's absolutely no doubt about that, which is kind of crazy, seeing as I'm an 11 hour plane ride from where they are right now. <laughs> That's amazing, there's a buy-in now. Yeah, 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 it's, a, it's an understanding and an appreciation and listen, back home, the game has grown so much in the time that I've been away, but unless you're in the top two or three divisions back home, in men's soccer, yeah. like it's not really a, a, a lifestyle. Um, I mean, you've got to have another job. Yeah. And now if you're in the top five or six divisions, it can be full time. So I understand why my family didn't get it. And, you know, frankly, I'm not sure I've said this before, but for the first three years of my coaching, like I wasn't fully committed. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And that's the reason I did a couple of graduate assistantships. And then I kind of found my way in with a guy who I'll ever be grateful for, Matt Fannon. And he took me under his wing and the rest is history. Well, let's get into the early days. Mm -hmm. And at Concordia University, you were a graduate assistant. Yeah. Graduate assistant, you were actually getting your master's, correct? Mm -hmm. so, so it started before that, right? I graduated in 2015 from Milligan. Okay. And then I was afforded the opportunity to work with the women's program, which for me was crazy because so many of the women on the team had been my friends. Wow. I had just graduated, which means that three years of people on that team I had to coach. And frankly, Omar, for you know, nine months of that season, I really struggled with it. Um, they were incredible as I reflect back. They made my transition from Dan the friend to Dan the coach way easier than it could have been. Uh, but that wet my appetite. I couldn't tell you our record. We were really bad. Um, but I had three great goalkeepers that were willing to listen to whatever madness I wanted to come up with at the time. And then from there, I was like, okay, I'm not ready to go home. Um, I still don't know what I want to do for a job. And I applied for eight or nine graduate assistantships and was fortunate enough to kind of find my way into the process of a few of them. And ultimately wound up at Concordia because it had a really good stipend. Mm. Uh, I didn't want to be reliant upon my parents for money anymore. And thus I moved from Northeast Tennessee to Nebraska. Let's kind of dive into a little bit of having those players be the same age as you. Mm. I had a similar situation here at Cal State LA. Mm. And again, it's your similar interests. You... I guess, are thinking about the same things in your life. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I had a lot of empathy towards mm -hmm. the guys where, hey, you're having a rough day a and word. you know, you're, uh, this, you're not doing well in school, you're failing some classes. So I had empathy, but also too, you have to draw that line of yeah. empathy, but a little bit of critique mm -hmm. and, and discipline and all that. And I remember, I'll tell you a quick story. We were doing a session and this was my first few times with these guys. And mm -hmm. yeah, there's a little bit of pushback and they were having a rough day service wise. Mm -hmm. And the guys, I'm looking at them and I was uh, myself missing a few volleys i was trying to hit the bubble and i kept missing and missing and they were missing even more even I miss worse volleys all the time oh it's okay but i was i was 25 <laughs> imagine these guys 23 and i i go guys this is not good enough we need to get alex who was our goalkeeper we need to get him ready for this weekend this service is is, is terrible would you guys like that same uh, service in return and one of the goalkeepers looked at me and said coach your service isn't isn't uh, pretty is not good as well so i would take care of that first and I was, I was 25. So you're dealing with 20, 20, uh, 22 year olds. And my reaction was like, what the hell do I even tell this guy? Like, what do you, I've never had someone have the audacity to even question me in that sense. So I had, again, you kind of have those quick, like jump to conclusions. What am I going to say? Do I just light this guy up or do I, you know, take accountability? And then maybe there's so many ways this can go. So any stories from that, I guess, first 
chapter in your journey with you know girls that were your friends anything that uh, had happened Do you know what it made it really tough is that not only did i coach the people that had been my friends um, I also lived on campus in what at the time was called MSA. It stood for like marriage student accommodation. Mm -hmm. So I lived on campus. I worked on campus. For the most part, I ate on campus. And it meant there was no place to escape. I am so grateful for my five years at Milligan. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't be sitting here with you if it wasn't for that. I have no doubt about that. Um, but it's not as if I got to go home and home was 20 minutes away and reinvent myself as a new Dan. Mm. I think in my, I thought that they perceived me as Dan the player, that had, you know they would play before us on the road and then stay and watch our game. We'd all get on the bus back. And that, that blighted my first year. You know, what's interesting about the age part is that I just turned 30, um, but I still find myself in the age battle, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, last year, uh, another highlight of my career was being, uh, being a part of Carly Lloyd's last season. And I had the privilege of, in the same way I'm looking at you, in the last game against Chicago last year, she was in the huddle opposite me. And I stood there and thought, how have I been a part of Carly Lloyd's last season? But Carly was 39. I was 29. Wow. Um, so it brings its challenges. But as the, for the same reason that you say, like there's also an empathy and an ability to uh, understand what one is going through. And frankly if I'm any good at what I do at this stage in my career I think a large part of it is my age like I'm approachable no one calls me coach everyone calls me Dan I'm willing to take a little bit of stick um, but I've lived it you know I understand especially with technology and the way that these things work now yeah. um, I will evolve as a coach over time and I'm sure when I reach the ripe age of 40 and 45 and my hips are starting to fail <laughs> um, that'll be a little bit different but it it's a strength. I think it's just taken me a few years to realize that. What was your coaching style like or philosophy? Oh. And I like to ask this question because I myself with mm. Armando, who was on the podcast a few days ago, he and I sometimes will watch old pro GK mm. videos and there was a lot of one on one stuff. And mm. growing up, I had a little bit of Mexican influence. Mm. So I was doing a lot of plyometrics, jumping over hurdles. So sometimes I kind of laugh at what I found to be crucial and vital for a goalkeeper at that time mm -hmm. so for you what was something that maybe you look back on in, in those early mo early days of coaching and go oh that's a bit of a shocker it's, it's interesting it's actually just yesterday i sat down to think about what my philosophy is as a goalkeeper coach because you don't often have to articulate it mm -hmm. right um I, I was and still am a thief like i if you do something really well and i see you do it online <laughs> you best believe i'm taking it um and the way that I coach is, is a hodgepodge of those things. I think my philosophy honestly underpins, comes from what I never had. Mm. Um, as a goalkeeper in college, I was all right. You know, I wasn't a well beater. I found a lot of identity in my ability to strike a ball. And actually that's the same thing. You know, I'm 30 now and still find my identity and ability to strike a ball. Actually yesterday I was texting Kaylin Sheridan and, um, what did she say? She said, you're a bang average goalkeeper, but you're in a world-class ball striker. <laughs> uh, and that for me is a, as good a compliment as you can get, right? Um, but it comes from what I never had. My head coach in college was a former goalkeeper who played Division I. Um, but I never had much time with him as, uh, as a, him as a goalkeeper coach during college. So I didn't really progress. We didn't have an incredible relationship. And those things are things for me that are really important. It's so important that you, the goalkeeper, doesn't matter if you're 39 or 22 and you just come out of college you I need to know you yeah. and you need to know me uh, long before I am Dan the goalkeeper coach I want you to understand that I'm Dan the son the brother the boyfriend mm. because when times get tough which it inevitably will and that doesn't matter if you're in college or in pro you need to understand I'm a person first um, so that probably underpins my philosophy uh, is that I need to love you. And I, I hope that you really appreciate the value that I can bring. And then you look at the session design, right? And um, I'm sure I was the same as most people were, you know, five, six years ago. It was really rep based, really loud, um, brought a lot of energy to the session. And as I reflect back, a bit of a crutch for the session probably, like didn't provide a space for the guys and girls that I work with at Concordia and or Milligan to bring it themselves. Um, and then I went on a course uh, and Richard Hartis just kind of blew my mind and I haven't looked back. Mm. I think I've had a very similar experience to mm. you in the sense of what I didn't have as a goalkeeper. Mm. I had a goalkeeper coach who was at Air Force mm. and then, or he himself was at Air Force. Yeah. 
And so I think a lot of what he got was discipline oriented. And there were sessions when I was 15 to 17 years old at Galaxy Academy where he would just destroy us mentally. And I look back on it now and, and reflect and say, wow, he did a good job. But in the moment, you're 15, 16, and you don't really know how to to combat that or to really evolve from this. It, you know, you want to develop, but you're also kind of like, this guy just destroyed me in front of everybody. I'm, I'm picking up those pieces before I can pick up the tactical advice. And um, those were the moments I feel where I felt as I got into coaching that I said, man, I need to be somebody like you're saying, someone who can who you can lean on, draw that line, of course, of I'm your friend, but also at the same time, too, like I have a job to do and the head coach is going to ask me. And not because you're my friend, I'm going to say, hey, you should start. But I felt that those moments influenced the way that I coached. And funny enough, at Cal State LA, one of the goalkeepers, he came up to me and it was a starter. And he said, coach, you can lay into me a little bit if you want. <laughs> like, I think, you know, I, I do well and I thrive off a coach kind of yelling at me and battering me. So can you do that for me every now and again? And I was like, Alex, I, I love to. But again, like it, it's, it would cause a little bit of friction with what I'm all about mm-hmm. because I'm not somebody who just yells because of maybe just the past experiences that I have. So is there anything that other than maybe being a crutch and being somebody mm-hmm. to help, like have you ever caught yourself in a moment where somebody asked you to do something as a coach that maybe helped them, but you were kind of hesitant because it maybe didn't align? Yeah, so um, one thing that I think I do quite well is seek out feedback. Mm-hmm. Um someone put out on Twitter, it might have been Jill Lloyd and um, being a goalkeeper coach can be a really lonely thing, right? Especially on a, like a multidisciplinary team where you operate with your group and everyone's got their own specialties. Um, but I seek feedback out quite well. And at the end of every season, no matter whether it was in 2015 with Milligan or 2022 with Angel City, I send my goalkeepers a message and I want them to like give it to me. I want you to tell me what I'm really good at, but even more important, I want to know what I'm not very good at. So I reached out to them all and um, I've received the vast majority of their feedback and, you know, Britt gave me feedback that challenged my philosophy, right? Um, And part of her feedback was, listen, I need you to, um, I need you to cater to the second or third choice goalkeeper, not just the first choice goalkeeper. And it's tough because so much of what I do is around whoever is starting, but she's spot on. You know, this year when the game started coming thick and fast, I... I neglected our second and third choice goalkeeper and that wasn't fair to them. Yeah. Um, but what I what we did is we spoke on the phone and what I've realized um, is that after a couple of weeks that can become a little wishy-washy in your mind and you remember what you want to remember, forget what you want to forget. So I asked them all to send me it in written form so I could collate it because I want to every couple of weeks just reflect on it so that when we get back to February, I can do them the service that they require. Um, there are so many points on their feedbacks forms that challenge who I am as a coach and in some of the things I disagree and will remain staunch because it served me really well and in the same way that I went to the course in 2018 and Rich and Hartis blew my mind um, there are points that they make that are spot on and I need to be able to step back look at myself in the mirror and be like okay let's see if we, we can't build that in to make you better because ultimately that's my job What's his name, Richard? Richard Hartis. Okay, give me one or two points that you're learning because I feel like it's influenced oh, you mate. dramatically. Um, so one or two points. I went to IGCC, Phil Wedden, mm-hmm. right? And a uh, bunch of people presented, Andrew Sparks. It was great, Jason Grubb. It was great. And then Richard Hartis presented. And I was like, wow, this is from another world. Um, and basically he was formative in shaping the way that England, the goalkeeping DNA was created. Tim, another person that's been really formative in that. And they wanted to have the ball rolling 80% of the time. And the way that traditional goalkeeper sessions had been run is that the ball weren't rolling 80% of the time. The in-possession focus was had become a massive part of the way that England wanted to play. Um, and watching his sessions was like, bloody hell. Like everyone is involved. Yeah. There is no lines. There's very few cones. There's there's scoring. That It's competitive. It's dynamic. It looks like the game. Um, and I he presented, this is really soft, he presented on a field and then we went into the classroom and he played a song, Gabrielle Dreams, on a speaker. And I just sat at the back of this room with like 50 <laughs> other coaches crying, thinking, what is going on? And I went back up to my hotel room that night and uh, sat down with a pen and paper. I was like, okay, well, how will I do that session? And I just put out a video a couple of weeks ago of my sessions from this season, right? And as I look back, 95% of it is influenced by the 
40 minutes I watched Richard Hartis present on the field and then the stuff that Tim and Anthony and the, the crew put out um, pretty regularly to influence the way that we, we all coach. Wow. It just seems like the way that you process information, it's very like academic mm-hmm. and very much, again, you're somebody who is seeking higher education and you can get, you can be a graduate assistant and go for a silly major, but a master's and then a master's. I mean, that to me is something that I feel you can transition and translate into goalkeeping. So how is, I guess, your academic pursuit off the field? Like, what does that look like in terms of goalkeeping? Is it the IGCC? Is it, um, I know during COVID, we spent a lot of time on different forums mm-hmm. and, you know, going on Zoom. So just kind of take me through kind of how you measure those two and what are the similarities and how you absorb information? So I got my undergrad in poli sci, right? Got nothing to do with being a coach. <laughs> okay. um, and with a minor in English. And then I went to uh, Concordia and got my MBA, but it was an, an emphasis on leading teams through times of change. And as I reflect, it wasn't anything to do with that. Um, but there are things that I think are really, really important that you have to, that being in academia provides. One of them is feedback, right? Like you turn something in, you get a grade, and that grade is against a rubric. And in soccer, like pro soccer, college soccer, that rubric might be the game model, right? Um, feedback might be film and me actually giving you feedback. It's really easy as a goalkeeper coach and goalkeeper to not set aside time once every six weeks to go and discuss what's going really well and what we need to do better, especially in the mire that is like the pro soccer and a couple of games a week. Um, deadlines. You know, deadlines are something that I've realized that they mean a lot to me. If I'm going to do something and you want me to present something and tell me you want me to present it by because it will shape everything that my mind does. Um, Frankly, and I've just realized this a couple of days ago, part of what I love about the academic pursuit is the chance to impress somebody, right? It's to turn something in and put my everything into it and make you proud that you're the one that's influenced me. Uh, And so much of what I do as a coach, I think, is influenced by that, too, is that I want to put on sessions and watch those sessions bleed into game day and then half time or after the game be like, and then the next day go into the film and clip the practice and then the game and show you the two together and sell you that what we're doing is working. Um, And it's done in a really subconscious, yet intentional way. Um, The next thing I love about school is doing it with people, Mm. right? Um, so I went to got my MBA and then I went to Bowling Green and for a year I was on my OPT so I didn't have to be in school and then um, I needed to get back to school as a result of my visa so I started my doctorate best course I've ever been in unbelievable I was in the course and I was the youngest person in there by a country mile and it was in academic uh, academic leadership and administration yeah Educational leadership and administration and in there were deans of colleges principals superintendents of school districts um, people that had like spent days with the president because of what they'd done. I mean, it was mind blowing. Wow. But to sit there and be like, I've got to get through this. Um, it makes you better. Like it stretches you. You, you have to grow. And um, that course, my, the EDD in uh, Ed Leadership, I would leave. It was six hours. It was once a week on a Thursday from 3.15 to 9.20. It was a six hour class. Wow. Um, and I would leave every week at 9.20 thinking, I can apply this tomorrow to the field. Um, one of our professors, and I haven't done this in my group at Angel C, so I hope you don't put this out yet. Okay. But I'm going to do it next year. <laughs> okay. Um, is she, she put a bunch of books on a, on a table with um, scissors and glue and pencils. And she said, okay, you've got an hour. I want you to describe who you are. And so everyone likes cutting and sticking and putting stuff down. And then so we all presented and she said, okay, I want to be really honest with you. What you put on your paper is really cool. Like, it's great. But it's actually how you did it that was really impactful. And she just sat back with a pen and paper. And she'd watch the time crunch. And there were 12 people in the class, but only two sets of scissors. And one glue stick. And five pens. So actually, she watched how you interacted with the team. And were you going to be someone that waited for the scissors because you're really clean? Or did you just want to get it done and rip? Mm. Because that says something about who you are as a person. Were you okay sticking Or did you want to put tape over it? Did you align? Was everything on your paper straight? Um, Did you use color? Did you use words? What was the size of the font that you took from the book? Was it a small font? Because that says something about you as a person. Was it a big font? Because that says something about you as a person. And I was like, wow, this woman is unreal. Um, And it's those moments in academia that I'm really grateful for. And I think I continue to seek out. 
can see how passionate you are about it, which is pretty yeah, cool. Sorry, that's my fault. No, no, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. I like it. And I think the two things that it stuck with me, the mm-hmm. constant feedback, but also to the group mm-hmm. setting and the group involvement. And I know you guys had Didi, who was your, your starter this yep. season. And then you had, I forget her name, but the the, the German goalkeeper Almy. from Wolfsburg. Yeah. Almy, whose resume speaks for itself. Yeah. And Brittany. Yeah. And Maya. Maya, yeah. So you had those four goalkeepers. And I know with Brittany's feedback and, mm-hmm. and all that, and I watched your guys' you know, I, like you said, you kind of look and see what other people are doing. Yeah. And one of the things that I attribute that I really love about you is kind of getting everybody involved. Everybody in the session has a role to play, not mm-hmm. just I'm going to serve this ball. It's more so this pass to you is going to be a shot, but I want you to work on your reception and how you take a touch and a leading touch and all that. So everything seems that it's it's helping each person. Um, but back to the group setting, how are you able to kind of manage the whole group Didi being the starter and then Almy coming in and then obviously Brittany just giving her an opportunity to continue to grow in, in her development. As are most things in life, Omar, like your greatest strength is your greatest weakness, right? And part of what I love about being a goalkeeper coach is that I work with four people. That's it. And I get to know them really, really well. And I have to design sessions that challenge them. Um, and so much of what we do is about not being able to hide and having to perform um, and translate. And so part of the feedback that Brittany gave me, for example, is uh, I want more reps. I'm like, okay, I completely agree. There's probably one day a week that I do need to give you more reps. But I also need you to recognize that you may play in a game and have to make one save. And the one save that you make is the one opportunity you get. Um, and that's where Didi was so good for us this year is that there were games where she'd have to do two things and the two things she did, she'd do them brilliantly. And so much of our session looks like that, right? In the group setting, like the in possession, the out of possession. Um, but you might get, if someone doesn't have a good strike, you know, the whole the whole phase may end on a strike. But if the person misses the target, then miss the target, Yeah. right? So we can either complain or moan that we didn't get the strike or we can find that, okay, were you in the right position? Did you track the ball well? What did you do up until that point? And that for me is the part that coaching in the small group is really, really, really important and enjoyable. And so that I love that part, mm-hmm. but it's like you're saying, once games come thick and you know thick yeah. and fast, and I had the same experience yeah. this season, but our situation was a little bit different. Mm-hmm. We were rotating goalkeepers, so you had weeks and and there were moments where our goalkeeper was or our uh, abraham who was the second goalkeeper for us at times he was training with us and tomas was with the first team yeah so it was it was those tough conversations of like hey i know you're not playing this weekend but you are playing let's say in a week time a week's time so i i need you to buy in and he was so easy but it was like i need you to buy in we're going to do the session today to get you fit and Mm -hmm. ready to go so we had a good understanding of like okay today's going to be a lot of reps and and we have a game in two days but you're not playing so at the the chance that you end up playing hopefully you're not exhausted but getting him fit and Mm -hmm. ready and staying mentally and that was that conversation of like i need you to buy in and stick with me you're not playing but i'm going to give you everything as if you are the starter and then once you are the starter next week it's an easy transition so for you did having to manage, again, different personalities. And Almi's coming in, and she is, I mean, a legend in her own right and playing for Wolfsburg, and I don't know how many Champions League finals they've been to and how many things she's done with Germany, but how were you able to manage that expectation of maybe the the club bringing her in? And then Didi now, was there a conversation? Yeah, it's really tough, right? Um, I want to give you a visual. How would I put this? Like, at the intersection of reality and expectations lies disappointment mm. right so if i'm if i'm not straight up with you and something else happens you're going to be unhappy um, and that's something that i think i did all right this year i need to get way better at it for the women that i work with um, but a really important part of the season for me actually happens a day or two prior to the season that's coffee that like we'll go get coffee and in part you learn about me but we'll talk about the expectations and kind of set what the reality is going to look like so that if it happens, it's not a shock. Yeah. Right. Um, but a part that I need to get better at is I need to be a way better communicator to goalkeeper two, three, and four in the week, match day minus two, match day minus one. Um, I, I didn't do that well enough this year. Adding Almi to our group was a challenge beyond belief. And like for the group dynamic, it was a challenge, but for me, it was a challenge, right? Is that I am 30. She is 31. 
She's wildly accomplished. Dee Dee's playing out of her mind. You know, like she was integral in the points that we got this year. We've got Brittany, who has been uh, a number of two for three quarters of the season. And Maya, who has found her way onto the bench a couple of times or traveled and not traveled. And then we're dropping a world class goalkeeper in the mix. It was like, Poof. and frankly, Omar, in so many ways, I think I failed um, our women in that respect. And that's another part of my reflection process, right? And feedback process is how can I best serve you? And they all, they all want as much communication as they can get. My challenge this year was me not wanting to, I'm okay with like tough conversations, um, but over communicating. Like if you haven't been in the squad for three or four weeks, then do you want to hear the same thing for three or four weeks in a row? Like I wouldn't. Yeah. Um, and that's something that I don't think you can never be perfect, but I really got to get better at. And then you throw Maya in the mix. Uh, Maya is an incredible person, brilliant goalkeeper. Um, she came from Hartford in Connecticut. She wasn't drafted. She'd gone to a couple of other clubs, like tryouts and hadn't seen anything. And I watched some videos where I thought, this she can be really good. Um, so we brought her in, but managing her expectations, right, is part of what makes our club so special is that we get 20,000 people at a game. But this young person played at Hartford no disrespect, she may have played in front of 40 people. So how can I integrate her into the environment, not bringing the environment down for Dee Dee and Almi and Brit, who may have to perform at every given moment? That for me was a challenge that in the moment I tried to be really intentional about. And as I reflect back on, I think I did the Maya one well, could have done it better. Mm. It's that academic, like you said, a deadline or turning something mm. in and you're essentially turning something in every single day. Yeah. Your session plan, and then you're managing the EQ, the emotional side mm. of things. And were you early on in your coaching? Did you feel like your emotional intelligence was high and you understood, again, you're talking about you know, coaching the younger goalkeepers, but I guess along that process, was your emotional intelligence at a good level or did you feel like every experience you got a little bit more understanding of this is what this person needs to hear in this moment? But I think there's a difference between emotional intelligence and emotional stability right. as a young coach I was emotionally intelligent like I knew what you wanted to hear but mm. I wasn't emotionally stable a space that I've got a lot better over the last couple of years and frankly it come from feedback from my bosses like Dan you could be really really good but I need you to be more emotionally stable is I have become a more emotionally stable which means I can make decisions and remove emotion from it as much as possible and kind of take it objectively um, a space that i put great value on as a coach way more than I do tactical is the emotional intelligence like what do you need what's going on in your life what do you need to hear when do you need to hear it um, it doesn't mean that I always get it right but something that I find great value in is is texting our women if they do something brilliant and that could be on game day but this year Brit played twice right so how can I celebrate Brit if she's only playing twice well, then I'll go back through the film and I find something on our Spideo camera that was brilliant because she needs to know that she's growing. She just doesn't have a marker on game day to measure it, right? Dee Dee's markers were obvious because her saves made it onto Twitter and she'd win save of the week. I still have an obligation to highlight that. Um, Maya's markers were, there was a moment early on in the season where we'd been in the environment for seven or eight weeks and Kristen was staying after and taking penalties and Maya was in goal. And Kristen took three pens and Maya saved them all. And for Maya, that's, that's Maya's gold medal, right? Like that's the everything. And that for me is the emotional intelligence part. Like how can I build those things in or put them in positions where they can have those wins that don't happen in front of 20,000 people. And then there's the emotional stability part for me is I can only do those things if I continue to work on my emotional stability, which for as a coach, I think is integral. As I was watching back a couple of sessions uh, from a few days ago, there are moments in sessions that I celebrate someone's save, but there are also moments that I am like beaten down by someone not doing something that they wanted to do. And that's a space I need to get better, actually. Short story, um, about two and a half months into the season, Maya, our youngest goalkeeper, said, hey, can we sit down after practice? So we sat down and she said, listen, you are so important in our sessions. You give so much energy. But when things aren't going well and you look devastated, it sucks the energy out of the session. Um, and the three of them had basically come together and said, listen, we need to we need to give Dan a little bit of a pep talk here. And um, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. When you have a relationship with the women that you work with that they feel comfortable, right? I was, I was reading something about 
uh, emotional safety, a psychological safety. And that is psychological safety. When the group feel that they can come to you and say, this is what we need, whilst they're doing it because things aren't going well, ultimately I think they do it because they care and they feel they can. And that for me, I think underpins who I am as a coach. Wow, that's a good ROI, good return on the, inv- the investment of you're investing in them. And sure, they obviously right. came together. And yeah, yeah. it was really cool. You. Really cool. Jeez. I mean, you just said something that now that I think about having the goalkeepers that we had, we mm-hmm. had Cabral Carter, who's a very good goalkeeper. He's at Pittsburgh University. Mm-hmm. He was with us at the beginning of the season. And then after that, we, we transitioned to, we have a U19, so mm-hmm. we rotated some guys in. But he was integral for us, I think, helping out Abraham, mm-hmm. who at moments in the season... It was a little devastating for him not to be playing because he was in good form and we had to uh, adjust and, and the first team needed uh, Tomas, who was the third in the pegging order. He needed games. So it was tough to take Abraham out of those situations. Mm-hmm. But again, now looking back and the way you're kind of describing the camaraderie and the chemistry within the group, Cabral was always there for Abraham and they always had good conversation and um, helping him with his technique was a good opportunity for Abraham to, I guess, take his mind off other things. But I didn't recognize that enough. I saw it. But just you saying a text or walking up to him and saying, hey, aside from what I'm giving you advice on or what we're discussing on the field, I just want you to know what you're doing for Abraham is integral for this group. I thank you for that. So now I'm going to hopefully try to implement that a little bit more. Is it so important? A small conversation can really change the way someone feels in that moment and what they bring to the group. And I think a lot of times it's just numbers. You oh, made it, yeah. Like it's massive. And for me, it's top down, it's bottom up, it's laterally. It's, I want that for my boss, right? Um, I want to be able to do that to our assistant coaches, but I also want our goalkeepers to feel comfortable doing that to me. And there were a couple of times this year that Britt would send me a text after practice and say, hey, I love today. Today was great. Um, or Didi in her end of year feedback, she gave me the feedback and then at the bottom there's a paragraph and it was like, Listen, any success I've had this year, she won MVP for her club, right? Any success I've had this year is in large part as a result of you. Um, So they kind of recognize they are emotionally intelligent, Mm. right? To recognize what I need. And a large part of what I love about this role is the number of people that you work with, but that it is two-way, right? Like my job is to prep you to compete, is to help you grow. And when you win on game day, I, I will be really happy for your successes, but they're your successes. And when you struggle on game day, I will dominate those those failures for you because I've got to do a better job and recognizing that it is two-way. I love that. So you go to Iowa State mm-hmm. and it's Big 10 or Big 12? Big 12. Okay, Big yeah. 12. Yeah. Big 10 back in my day yeah, when yeah, I grew yeah, up. Yeah. So Big 12, was that a shock to you in, in terms of the teams you're playing against now, the level you're seeing now? The goalkeepers are a little bit better and yeah. you're recruiting a little bit better of goalkeepers. So your coaching style, you're seeing things that maybe you hadn't seen in the past. Are you adopting and seeing new things and saying, whoa, I like the way they... Two parts. Uh, the first, the biggest part was the travel, right? Is that we had to travel all over the place for games. Uh, only two games that we play in conference, we could we drive to both the Kansas schools. But the rest, we'd get on a bus and dr- drive to Des Moines. And then we'd get on a flight to Des Moines and connect in Dallas and go to Lubbock or TCU or West Virginia. Um, that was an epic experience because when I wanted to come over to America in 2010, 2011, that was what I envisaged college sport to be like, right? Like you get on a plane, and you travel over the joint. So that was epic. Um, and then the next part is it opened the door for me able to recruit and work with really special people, right? Like I I got to Bowling Green and had a really good, I was blessed. I had a great group of goalkeepers in Kathleen Doovey, who's now the coach at, goalkeeper coach at DePaul. And then uh, Victoria Cope, like really special. And then we brought in a young person called Becky, very good. Um, but when you get to the power five and you know your schedule is going to be what it is, you, you can recruit the creme de la creme. So we got there and um, we needed to add a goalkeeper. So we added a young girl called Jordan Silkowitz, who was at Ohio State at the time. We'd played against them at Bowling Green. And I never did this back then. I try to do it more now. But after the game, I went up to her and said, you were unreal today. Um, I mean, she was so special. We played them in a spring game. She was all over the, like, uh, magical. So she ended up in the transfer portal. And I was like, wow, like, how can I get her to Iowa State? Um, so I called her up. This is an epic story. <laughs> I called her up 
and on FaceTime and she answered the phone and she had an iPad and Apple Pencil and she was in a parking lot at Ohio State in Columbus. And she was like, hey, I've only got 20 minutes. I've got UCLA after. And I was like, oh, golly, <laughs> like this is not good. Um, so I was like, okay, have a blast with UCLA. And about two days later, I shot her another message like, hey, how everything's going? She's like, okay, uh, yeah, I would love to get on the phone again, but I've got another call with Oklahoma State who had just won the Big 12. Oh, I was geez. like, okay, where else are you talking to? And it was UCLA, Oregon, Oregon State, Oklahoma State, Florida, Tennessee. Um, I mean, it was USC. It was ridiculous. Um, and I was like, how am I going to get this young person here? And it wasn't because I was a great coach. It was because I invested in her as a person. Um, and she's at Iowa State now. She's thriving. She will be the most likely the most sought after goalkeeper. If she chooses to enter the draft, she will be the most sought after goalkeeper in the draft. Um, but some of the schools, she, she turned down the SEC winner, the Pac-12 winner, the Big Ten winner, and a couple of ACC schools to come to Iowa State. What did that um, mean to you? It was massive, right? Like, it was huge. Um, so much of the reason, when I got to Bowling Green, Matt said, like, where do you see yourself in a couple of years' time? And I, I think I said Clemson or something like that at the time, because I, I want to work with the best, because they challenge you and they're comfortable giving you feedback. Mm -hmm. And it, there is some reciprocity. Um, and... When Silk called me to commit, in fact, I'm going to show you this, if this is okay, one second, because <laughs> I, I have it saved, uh, because it was absolute, the way she did it was a testament to who she is as a person, but she knew she knew what I needed to. The way she committed to Iowa State was unreal. Here it is. Wow. I'm going to do a screenshot so people can see yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeez, I was sitting, mate. I was sitting. How many in, I was sitting in the office. I was sitting in the office, and when this came through, I was like, "I was like, what does this mean?" She was like, "I want to come to Iowa State." It's like, "What?" She's like, "Yeah." Wow. Yeah, it was really cool. Um, so Iowa State was a really special time because it opened up the next realm of the standard, the travel, the expectations. Um, you know, football game day. You know, sixty-five thousand people. Um, basketball, like one of the first events I went to Iowa State was a basketball match and it was them playing uh, Kansas who at the time were number one and there were 16,000 people and I went to a wrestling meet and there were 10,000 people, went to a gymnastics event and there were six, this is wild, got to Iowa State and there were 6,000 people there for gymnastics. My school, Milligan, there were 1,200 people. Oh there were five times the amount of people at a gymnastics meet that went to my entire college. Um, so that was mind blowing for me and I was there during covid so was there uh, after three months, got shut down and then did the full season, like having to test three times a week. And um, obviously that opened up the whole Zoom stuff, which I didn't realize would be as influential as it has been in cultivating some relationships with some really cool people. Uh, but it has. And for that, I'm grateful too. That's incredible. That's a, like it's in your personal journey as a coach. It seems like you've the personal investment is a staple. That's like probably number one yeah. in terms of, does it again, it goes back to, did you feel like you didn't have that, some a person giving you that proper investment of saying, Dan, let me put my arm around you and let you know it's going to be okay. Or uh, a text message when you know that you needed somebody in your corner that did you not have that? I'll be honest with you. It's two prong. Uh, the first one is that like, I, I didn't have that as a player, but I think it would have made me better as a player. And two, I was all right at what I did as a player, but I couldn't fall back on it, mm. right? Like I didn't have some stellar playing career where I was at an incredible academy back home and I'd played with the country's best. I didn't come to some mega school in this country and play in one of the best conferences. So it was like, well, what can be, what am I really good at? And it might be cultivating a relationship with someone, like learning what they want to learn and sharing a little bit about me. Like that was my x factor it wasn't that i could teach you how to spread brilliantly right or that my sessions were world class um and to this day i feel the same thing like my sessions are good but i think as a coach personally is where i excel dan abrahams was on our podcast mm. a while back mm. and he was talking about how maybe it's the ego for some coaches and especially in goalkeeping mm. they always see a goalkeeper's mistakes in training or in games as being technical or tactical or a lack of understanding in either of those mm -hmm. when in reality if you dig a little bit deeper that person may be dealing with something psychologically that influenced that decision mm -hmm. and i think just hearing the way you're doing it and i i heard that that soundbite and i was 
kind of shocked because I was like, wow, that was it's so obvious. I don't know why I didn't consider that sooner, but it was also one that you can easily practice. And, and I can go to you, Dan, and say, hey, man, like, how was your week? Mm. Everything okay? Oh, man, I had, I had finals yesterday. I'm exhausted. Oh, you didn't get much sleep? Oh, f- okay. So today, in, in today's session, I, I understand that you didn't get that much sleep. So I'm going to try to tailor where we get a lot of shots in the bubble and get a lot of repetitions where I'm not killing you. But I want you to just give me your best focus, and then you can go home and get some rest. But I want to try to gear and tra- uh, tailor the session towards you in that sense so you feel like it was a, a successful uh, session. And again, it seems like it's tough when you have the four goalkeepers this season, but it seems like through small conversations and through your past and that influencing how you are uh, engaging with people, mm-hmm. that influence how every session you can kind of cater to, uh, to everybody. For me, it's 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 not Dan the coach to the goalkeepers. It's both ways. An mm-hmm. example of that would be this, is that at coffee at the start of the year, I, I, I guarantee I say this, listen, life's going to happen for me too, right? I'm going to get a phone call saying something's happened to your grandma or my girlfriend and I have had an argument and like, frankly, I just don't want to be on the grass. Um, and there were one or two sessions this year that I started off by saying, listen, life's happening for me um, and I'm going to need you all to pick it up a little bit today because I can't bring everything. And what I find is after 10 minutes, the, the grass is my safe space, right? Mm-hmm. So I actually forget about what's going on in the world. But I want them to recognize that I'm a human too. No matter if I design the session or I'm really intense at practice, which is feedback that I get that I am, like I'm a human too. And if they recognize that life can happen to me, then they're most likely going to be open to sharing that life is happening to them. And then it becomes this really healthy, like positive cycle in which we share. And if I can understand who you are, then I can get the best out of you. It's amazing. And so you moved from Iowa State. Yeah. It was during the COVID time, right? So this was a bonkers story. (laughs) Tell me, tell me how you got it to Gotham City. Um, So I, COVID happens and I'm like, okay, well, this is what a great space to get better, Um, but can't go anywhere. No licenses, no certifications, nothing. Um, So how can I figure this out? And I can't remember how it happened. Oh, I can. Um, So Tim Dittmer has become like a, incredible mentor for me Um, and in my doc program the professor was like hey you're going to read stuff in this program that you should reach out to the author and tell them you like what they do so I sent Tim a message on Instagram was like hey uh, love your work what you're doing for the goalkeeper community is really special when I'm at home I'd love to get a coffee and he responded and I was like wow Um, so we went to watch a game together back home it was Man City Sheffield United and we were watching Dean Henderson and I was like what am I doing here like this is all picked (laughs) up pace real quick anyway COVID happens and I'm like how can I pull the community together so I go on Twitter I'm like hey guys why don't we all get on and do a call so we get on and there are like 15 people and then the next week I'm like okay well how can I I need to reach out to someone so I, I think I reached out to Tim I was like hey would you mind getting on and presenting something and he was like yeah sure um and then that led to another group of coaches coming on. And before I realized it, I was in a Zoom call with like some of the world's best. And me, Dan, like at Iowa State, just sitting there sending out the link, <laughs> right? But then but then like Matt Doyle would come in, who's now at Arsenal. Yep. A really, really, really talented practitioner. And he'd be like, hey, Dan, why don't X person present next week? So then Anthony White present. And suddenly, like, it was so organic. Anyway, um, a person that I wouldn't, be, I know that I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for this person. Jill Lloyden was on the course, right? I think she is in the top three goalkeeper coaches in the world. She has influenced what I do and how I do it to no end. Um, she texts me and she knew that I was in a little bit of a visa predicament. Like I had to be in, a sc- in school at Iowa State and I didn't want to be in school. I was committed to the profession and going to school Monday, Wednesday and Friday doing a statistics class was doing nothing for me. So I got a text message like, hey, are you interested in going to, at the time we were Sky Blue, and they rebranded to Gotham when I got there. And I was like, yeah, let me have a look at the roster. So I got on the roster, and on the roster was Carly Lloyd, um, and at the time, Mal Pugh, and Midge Purse, and Kaylin Sheridan, and Didi Haricic. And I was like, sure. Um, so on a Thursday, I took a little mid-afternoon siesta, you know, and I woke up to a message on LinkedIn from Freya, who's now my boss, saying, hey, like your name's been put forward, would you like to interview? So one thing led to another, and I was fortunate enough to get the job. So then I got a professional visa, which was epic, because I didn't have to be in school, um, and I moved to Jersey. And from there, the last 18 months has been a whirlwind <laughs> beyond belief. Yeah, an absolute whirlwind. You were, I'm sure, pinching yourself daily, saying, oh, mate. where am I? Who am I around here? So 
it, it was bonkers for lots of reasons, right? But the first reason was that I rocked up and um, we did a session prior to preseason starting because Caelan was going to camp with Canada and I'm kicking balls at Kay and you know, I've got Mandy McGlynn who is thought of as being a really special young goalkeeper just getting back from Sweden. She'll be with Gotham next year. And then Megan Hins who had a really distinguished college career in Michigan and Dee Dee and I'm kicking balls and talk about nerves. Like I'm hitting volleys and in my mind like they're just flailing off other people's <laughs> shoulders and <laughs> I have never been so scared in my life. And then a week into preseason, Carly, um, Carly was doing something and she come in and I was standing in the hallway and she's like, hey, I'm Carly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know who you are. <laughs> um, and yeah, mind blowing. The, do you know what, Omar? The coolest part of that whole year was how these seasoned professionals, people who have been coached by the world's best, um, welcomed me in. Didn't matter that I was 29 or 28 at the time. Didn't matter. Um, they made me feel like I brought value. Mm. And that for me is the part that I love most about coaching at this level in the NWSL is that people want to get better, right? So you're always on stage. Like they feel like they're on stage, which they are, right? Player coach. But as a coach, you're on stage too. When you stand up in front of a room and you've got World Cup winners and Olympic winners and people that won NCAA championships, like everyone's got there because they've had bad coaches, because they've had brilliant coaches. And they are really good. Mm. And when you stand up, you've got to deliver your stuff. Because if you don't, the room's flat real quick. Um, and that is what has been the last 17, 18 months. That's incredible. And I think moving from Iowa State to mm. there, it got you a little bit prepared, no? I mean, just kind of how big those events were at, mm. in a Big 12 environment. Mm. Did that prepare you mentally to say, wow, okay, I've been, I've been at a big school and a big conference. And that transition now to the, cream, the creme de la creme of, of women's sports NWSL was that a good transition or did you struggle a little bit to say wow I'm really here my imposter syndrome was a real thing it's a real thing yeah um first three or four months at practice I'd be like what am I doing here um and I'd go home and I would I'd real I'd stress like I really would stress and I'd say something and I'd be like do they believe it you know, I'd stand up in front of the room and Carly would ask a question. And when her hand goes up, I felt like a river was flowing down my forehead, but it wasn't, <laughs> right? Or I'd be doing set pieces. Freya was like, hey, I want you to lead set pieces from now. And I was like, okay, the first day I did set pieces, I'm telling you, man, <laughs> I was absolutely terrified. Um, and, you know, you've got to have your stuff together. And one of them will ask a question. You're like, well, I haven't worked through this in my head. So you've got to do it on the fly. <laughs> um, and actually what I realized is that a really endearing thing can be, that's a great question. I want to give you a brilliant answer, but let me go away and think about it because mm. I want to give you the answer that best serves the team. And I'm not just going to BS something for you on the fly. Um, it didn't prepare me. No, like I, I have worked. I'm so grateful. I have had some brilliant bosses, right? Some bosses with unbelievable attention to detail um, that care for me in a way that words can't begin to describe. Um, and that prepped me for this role. Um, but I don't think anything can. And that's okay. My dad would say, like, you're never ready to be a dad. You're just one day a dad. Yeah. And that's how I feel like being a goalkeeper coach in the professional leagues. Like, you're never ready for it. Just one day you are. And suddenly you're kicking balls at people that are some of the best in the world. And, like, you figure it out. Yeah. Well, Caitlin Sheridan is, I know, with the situation in Canada, mm -hmm. she had to sit behind... Oh Steph LeBay. Steph LeBay. Yeah. And then now she's kind of touted as probably the next number one world number one how was i know the imposter syndrome and all that but again navigating trying to make sure that you're not impeding her development but you're actually helping her progress mm -hmm. and not only progress but to kind of reach her full potential yeah listen i moved across the country um to work with Kay. i think that's fair to say and then i was blessed to experience Dee Dee and mandy and Stu. um question Go on. was it a selling point what was more of a selling point? Obviously, it was all wrapped into one, but the visa or now, hey, you have a chance to coach one of the best yeah, young was, prospects. Yeah, it was that. It was so, okay. like, you, 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 listen, you could coach one of the best goalkeepers in the world. And I was like, fair <laughs> enough. Um, yeah, I mean, mega. What, what makes it crazy? And I could never have prepared for this, but when I got there, she left to go to camp and play in the She Believes Cup. And in the first game, tore a muscle in her hip. Yeah. Um, so 
um, mad few minutes because it happened early on in the game. I'm sitting in uh, our house in New Jersey and it's the first time I've watched one of my players play on like TV, right? I'm like, oh, that's Carly and that's Kaylin and that's Midge. <laughs> that's, that's epic. And then she receives a back pass and Carly's pressing her and I'm like, okay, I think she's going to Cruyff her. And she goes to hit it and like hits the deck basically. And I'm like, oh, that's not good. Like she's cramped. And then she t- they take her off and I'm like, okay, what's going on here? And then we found out that she had to have surgery and um, it was an Olympic year, right? The Olympics happened in June or July. Um, but then we're also in a predicament where, Kate, well, Caden is the person that's played for four years for this club. So we need to, you know, develop a, a new starter. Um, and that was a challenge that I hadn't really thought about. You know, Caitlin had been really robust, really durable. Um, sky's the limit, still is. Um, but we had to figure out who was going to play. Um, and we had a, a, a strong group of goalkeepers. And to be fair, the club had done an unbelievable job. Our group in the league last year was, I mean, it was unrivaled. Um, any one of them could have played. But managing that was another challenge too. Another thing that I don't think I did very well. Mm. And Didi stepped in. Didi, um, yeah, it was, you know, it was really close. Frankly, it was between Didi and Mandy mm-hmm. and it, it could have gone either way, but Didi had been in the league for six years and truly had deserved it. Um, it would not surprise me if Mandy McGlynn played every game in this league next season because she's really special. But we went with Didi and she dominated. She absolutely dominated. She stood in the head. The club made it to the Challenge Cup final. She played at Portland. She made a save in the final off of Christine Sinclair that... I mean, it's just mad. Um, and then she played 11 or 12 games for the club. Then Kaylin came back and assumed the position. She went to the World Cup, went to the Olympics and won a gold medal, as you do. Yeah. Um, and then when it got to the end of the season and Anu was coming here, the expansion draft was a thing. It was really only one person that made sense to bring. It was Didi because we knew that she could do what she could do. And now you guys have obviously worked at a second club together, mm-hmm. you and Didi. How is your guys' relationship going into this coming season? Or do you guys still keep in contact in the offseason now? Kay? Kay and I? Or Didi uh, and I? We can go with both, but Didi now, you, she's with you in this uh, Yeah, Didi and, I, Didi and I are, are, are super close. Uh, I mean, what's the day today? Friday? Thursday? I don't even know what day it is. <laughs> Today's Thursday. Thursday. <laughs> um, we worked together Monday, Tuesday. We worked together all last week. Um, she lives here. Like There is no off-season, like market stuff. Um, we have a great relationship. We have, like, she... I think she trusts me. I trust her. She's been brilliant for the group. She does some things really, really well. She grew into the role fantastically um, and has become a little bit of a cult hero for our club. You know, um, I think we're the only club in the league that sold a goalkeeper jersey last year. And that's because Dee did what she did. And she was kind enough at our end of season banquet to say, listen, I don't win MVP and support as player of the year if it's not for Dan. And like, that's lovely. Um, but ultimately, she's the one that gets it done. And then Kaylin and I, I, I'm so grateful for Kay. Um, she is so special. And coaching against her this year was really weird. Um, our first game of the Challenge Cup at Cal State Fullerton, it was me, Didi and Kaylin. And it was weird. But to watch those two compete against each other, then both last year saying that they were good enough to and then demonstrating that they could. And you can make a really good argument that those two and AD French this year were the best goalkeepers mm-hmm. in the league. I'm really proud to have been associated with them um, because they are stellar people and incredible goalkeepers. Yeah, I mean, it's you look at the NWSL and mm-hmm. it's so tough to be a starter in that league well, because there's so much talent. Yeah. And I think that is... I think for for the young goalkeepers aspiring to be in that league, do you have any tips for the young, I mean, male and female, but mainly the female goalkeepers out there who want to strive to play at a Big 12 school and then get into the NWSL? Is there something that you've seen with Didi, with Kaylin, with Maya, with, I mean, Mandy, everybody that you've worked with that kind of separates them? Is it personality? Is it technical, tactical, or altogether? Yeah, I think personality-wise, they're all um, high achievers, right? They're all really intense people in... One of the real shocks when I got to Sky Blue Gotham last year was how intense 5v5 was. <laughs> you know, a man, a man would let a goal in and I'd say like, it's okay. Like, it's not okay. It's not okay. Um, or Kaylin in training was so intense and Didi was so intense. Um, but I don't think you can coach that. The one thing that they have all done, which I would have been really nervous about as a young coach, was they've gone to seek out a bunch of different opinions. Last year, I... Um, and I'm, she knows this, like I struggled with the fact that a member of Kaylin's family is Jill Lloyden. Mm-hmm. 
a, a, someone that I ha- hold in such high regard, I was coaching Kay every day. And then in my mind, Kay was going to talk to Jill about Dan's just done this. And it was a really tough place to be, right? But Kayleen is Kayleen Sheridan because of the amount of people that have poured into her. Siri at Clemson, Eddie at Clemson, you know, the goalkeeper coaches she's had with the Canadian national team, Mike and now Jen. Um, she has taken all the good bits from those people and is a product of those environments. The same with Didi. You know, Didi sat in the league for six years before she played like meaningful minutes. And she's had really good goalkeeper coaches and really bad goalkeeper coaches. And she is a product of those environments. So if you're a young person, you have an obligation. If you want to get to where you want to get to, is to is to have a bunch of different people pour into you. Stylistic, right? Mm. If you did a session and I did a session, I guarantee they'd be different. Um, uh, but they would challenge people in different ways. And as I reflect on the really talented people that I've worked with over the last two years, they've all welcomed different perspectives into their mind and can take them on board really quick. And that for me is a differentiator. You can, with Kay and Dee Dee, you can say, I, I need you to do this or think about this. And instantaneously, you'll see them like consciously trying to build it into who they are. And that's the reason that they have grown to the level that they've grown to and will continue to grow to is because they know their bodies and their minds really, really well. That's amazing. Um, kind of want to go back to the imposter syndrome sure. because it is it is a legitimate thing. Yeah. And I remember this season in the preseason, mm-hmm. we had our sessions at like 7 p.m. So I had, it afforded me the time to go train with the first team. Yeah. And I asked the goalkeeper coach, Oka, I said, hey, do you mind if I join the session? I don't mind if I watch or just serve some balls. And he was like, if you want to be there, you can be there. Yeah. So, okay, great. First few times I went out there, it was, you know, I was nervous, but I wasn't the voice. And then there was a day where he said, hey, do you want to run the session today? And I said, are you sure? And he was like, yeah, yeah, you can run it. And I said, okay. But then I'm going out there and Maxime Cropo, obviously mm-hmm. with the terrible injury, but the whole season I've known him and I've made videos about him in the USL yeah. and I've made, I know who he is. John McCarthy, mm-hmm. I know him as well from my, his Miami days, his Philly days. And then obviously Tomas mm-hmm. played a bunch of games last season. So you have guys who have this this standard and this idea of who, they, they can each be at number one. So you're running a session and you're, I'm, I'm like, oh my God, I hope I don't say anything stupid. I hope I don't do anything crazy. And they always make fun of me like, oh, here's the Instagram guy. Here's the Instagram guy. Let's see what, you know, let's see if everything you do on your videos, if it, it adds up here. Um, but then, then there was a moment in the training session where I kind of like was looking at Oka and I said, Oka, like, I'm going to make this, this change. Like, do you mind if I coach Max real quick? And he goes, pretend I'm like, I'm not even here. You are That's the awesome. voice. You're the coach. You do it. And I think one thing I struggled with was like eye contact, but it yeah. was more just let me get past the fear of delivering this message and then the eye contact will come. Mm-hmm. But I'm kind of just like, okay, look, in this situation, I felt this could have been better. This could have been better. This is what we're looking for. So you're putting all these pieces together, but then it's happening and you kind of like block out. Then you walk off the field and you're like, holy crap, Crazy. that just happened. And that's an experience that it happened for the first time. And I know for a fact, I don't think I'm going to have those nerves ever again. Mm-hmm. And then there was another day where Max was, uh, what was no, they were warming up again and it was still early in the preseason. And I, I was going out there to do warm ups. And Oka has a specific warm up that mm-hmm. he does with each keeper. And so he was like, Hey, who do you want today? And I was like, uh, What do you mean? He's like, Choose any of the goalkeepers. You decide who you want and the whole warm up you take them. You can take them off to the side. I don't, want to, I don't even want to see you. Just go do it. And I said, uh, Honestly, I'd love to take Max. He's like, Okay, go for it. So I'm just like the number one, the starter, the club yeah. paid a good, a good amount of money for this guy. And he's the, the kindest dude, like the nicest guy. And okay, man, let's do it. And I work with him. And, and it was just like, you almost create these narratives in your mind and you buy into it. When in reality, as things start to happen, you're like, no, I'm meant to be here. Yeah. I'm, I have these experiences because I'm, I'm being offered them by people who truly believe in me. So uh, do you feel like you've gone past that or do you still have moments where at the bank you're hitting corners or crosses and you're kind of looking like oh boy um yeah i i want to tell you that i've got past it but i haven't Mm. right like um i i have reached a place where i believe that i can bring value to our team or that you could drop me in any environment and i could i can make it better but that doesn't mean that i don't have imposter syndrome um, in fact, I was talking to so Tim, um, I get on a Zoom call with Tim once every two weeks and I sit on the call with Tim and I'm still like worshipping. I mean, I really am. Um, and I sit there and I'm, I can't believe this is a thing. I, I hold him in such high regard. Um, you know, Kristen, 
um, I've worked with Kristen for a year now, but whenever I see Kristen, I'm, I'm still like, Kristen Press. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. Like, um, or I can say uh, Ali Long text. She sent me a text a couple of weeks ago, and it pops up Ali Long on my phone. I'm still like imposter syndrome. Um, the the advantage that I do have is that at practice and on game day, I can become really locked in, like so locked in, almost to a detriment, right? Where our sessions can become really intense. And that's what the goalkeepers got together and wanted to nudge me on at the start of the year. But that does mean that in those moments, I don't feel it. Um, Or like prior to film starting, I'll run one or two film sessions a week for set pieces. And prior to film starting, I'm like, right, imposter. (laughs) Uh, But then the moment I stand up and get to talking, gone mm. moment it's done back right or we brought Almi in and Didi and I have done you know 150 film sessions together like she knows what the flow is I know what the flow is but we dropped Almi into it who was FIFA goalkeeper of the decade um, and has won World Cups I mean she's really special but having her in film and I'd make a point and she'd be like well what about this like that's imposter syndrome boom boom um, and honestly mate like it's it's because I care like I really, I really care and I really want to bring value. Um, but I still, I'm like, this is mad. <laughs> you know, like the, um, we have some really cool supporter groups at Angel City and I'll get some stick on Twitter periodically because I'll miss the target. Um, and the, the stand behind the goal we warm up in is steep, right? There are people there. Yeah. You get, you take one to the face, yep. you feel it. Yeah. Um, I'm so locked into those moments that I don't recognize, but there are times at the end of warm up or as we walk out, walk out for warm up is my favorite time of the week at the bank. Mm. Music's playing, grass is wet. We walk out, I get to walk out with three of the world's best um, that I'm like, what am I doing here? And, but it doesn't paralyze me. Um, it just gives me an appreciation and it's appreciation that when I go home and think about our session or reflect on our session or plan a session or reflect or think about how I'm going to interact with one of the women I get to work with, um, it makes it better because I care, because I recognize how important the touch points that I have with the stakeholders that I work with are in their career, right? Is that part of the reason that I've been a goalkeeper coach, you get to work with four people. Um, but that means that my influence on them could be massive, yeah. right? So you asked a question a minute ago, like, did I help Kaylin? As I reflect on the year, probably not. Not on the field. Like, she's really special on the field. Off the field, I think we had some we had some really tough conversations or some really tense moments that we can both look back on and laugh about. But I think those made us better as professionals. Um, but imposter syndrome, like, I hope it doesn't disappear. Yeah. I really, I really do. I really do. It's. Uh, I don't think it will. Yeah. Because I'm. I think I'm the same way, and mm. I think a lot of people are. You. And it keeps you in check, I feel, Mm -hmm. because you're never going to take anything for granted. I think as soon as you start to settle in and it becomes like, okay, I'm entitled to these moments. I'm entitled to all these things that can cause a little bit of complacency and that complacency kills. And I think for all of us in goalkeeping, I think it's the thrill and everybody who can be an adrenaline junkie, but you'll never experience maybe jumping off of a, a building or whatever, jumping off a helicopter the way you do, I'm sure I have to do set pieces as well. Like you have to explain the set pieces and that quick story. We had that this season and our guy who did the, our head coach was the one who was doing it, but he forgot to move um, the defensive set pieces, which I was Mm -hmm. to the front. Mm -hmm. So I was usually the person who steps up and does the the thing first. Yeah. So I'm watching the first clip and it's the offensive for the other team for, and I'm watching and I'm like, why does this look like, different than the yeah. clips I sent you. And then as I'm like explaining it, I'm like, um, okay, well, my notes, they have six in the box, but here they have four. So, and then like after I went for like 20 seconds and Rico, our head coach goes, Omar, I'm so sorry, <laughs> guys, I'm so sorry. This is actually, these are Steven's clips, but Omar, you're being a good sport for trying to explain this. And my heart was pumping, but it was that moment where I was like, oh my God, the worst that could have ever happened has just happened. And I can kind of like exhale and be cool with this for the rest of the year. But um, but yeah, I hope it doesn't. But I know what you're saying. It's it's yeah. you train yourself to change the perspective of like, while I'm doing this to I get to do this. And I think that's special. I'm really grateful and blessed. And there are loads of people that I'd love to name that have been influential in that, um, that I get to do what I do and work with the people that I work with. And I hope the imposter syndrome doesn't disappear. Um, equally as much, I recognize that the people that I get to work with are still just people. Yeah. Right. Um, and 
that makes a really approach. One have had some amazing conversations with some people that two years ago, if you'd have said that I'd be sitting down with Carly Lloyd in a coffee shop or Kristen Press in a coffee shop, then I would have laughed. But like I'm sitting there and we're having a legit conversation and I hope that doesn't disappear. And if it does, honestly, Omar, I'm probably not in the right profession anymore. True. And what's crazy too is I think you, you even sitting with me and mm-hmm. like us getting coffee a few weeks ago, like I'm sitting with Dan Ball. Do you really like <laughs> relax? No, man. I'm I'm dead serious. Relax. I'm dead serious. Again, it's 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 the culmination of everything that you've done at this point is you've proven yourself at every level. And I know there's gonna be hopefully for me to you, I hope there's another level for you to get mm-hmm. to. I would love to see you hopefully with the US national team. Mm-hmm. But if England steals you away, I'm not I'm not fighting I it. Hope they do. That'd be great. <laughs> um but I know for a fact you have another level, another gear. So just know that there are people who when they sit down with you or even hear your name being on a podcast or whatever, we look at it and wow, okay, it's gonna be special. This guy has, I mean, you just have so many experiences. You articulate your points very, very well. And I know from this podcast, people will take a lot from it. So I wanted to ask you one more question before I let you go. Okay. From the journey you've taken and the steps you've taken in terms of self-awareness, what is some piece of advice that as you reflect on every experience that you've had from the self-awareness side, what what would you give people out there maybe who are struggling with their self-awareness that you learned in this uh, in this process? Um, I think I'm pretty self-aware. Um, one thing that I do think is a piece of advice that I, any coach probably needs to hear is have really cool people pour into you. I've used the word a lot in this podcast, but I mean it really sincerely. Like I'm blessed um, to have worked for some incredible bosses you know, at Milligan, at Concordia, um, Bowling Green, Iowa State, same person. Have people pour into you. Um, Sergio Gonzalez, Lloyd Yaxley, Jill Lloyd, and Tim Dittmer, Anthony Wyatt. Like people that have carved out time. These people have families, right? Have carved out time to give to me with nothing in return. Um, I don't get the opportunity at Gotham if it's not for Jill Lloyd in. Mm. Right, like my sessions don't get better if Tim doesn't take the time. Um, Anthony White has been an unbelievable communicator. Um, Sergio, like when I was at Iowa State, would sit on the phone for ages, like allowing me to bounce ideas off of him. Um, get yourself a really good mentor um, and and allow that person to pour into you because you'll become more, you'll become more self-aware. Um, I feel like far too many people are reluctant to get mentors and you know, you allude to sitting at coffee with Dan Ball, like that's BS. <laughs> but I am aware that I have an unbelievable platform with Angel City to influence the way that our profession is, like moves forward. And I want to continue to nudge that. And um, I'm all about like people reaching out and wanting to come watch training or chat or talk sessions or what of the challenges have been because my pathway isn't like rare, but it's also not the world's most normal um, the size of schools that I coached at, like the academic pursuits, the people that I've got to work with and how quickly it's happened, have all happened because I have unbelievable mentors that um, whether they recognize their mentors or not, in my mind they are, yeah. right? And these people have, have filled my glass that I get to pour into other people in my environment. And um, if Didi is stellar on game day, it's because our environment is great because it's been shaped by the people that have poured into me. That last piece right there, it's, it's, it, no, it is, it's the, someone's helping fill your glass Mate. and then you're passing it on to somebody else. And that's, ah, that's very impactful. I love that. Yeah. But Dan, thank you so much for thank joining you. the podcast and hopefully nothing but success comes your way. Hopefully you have a safe, uh, I guess, holiday season. Yeah, you best um, And then it. coming to the next season, hopefully I can uh, come out to some of the games and. Well, hopefully I'll get to work with you at some point in the not too distant future on the grass. Sure. I've seen all of your. Uh, the content that you've put out, but to be able to see it in the flesh would be fantastic because um, I started this podcast off by saying this and I'm going to end it by saying that I'd love to be a thief of some of your stuff too because <laughs> I'm sure it's good. Likewise. So please uh, just know that I will be shaking the first five minutes of, <laughs> of that session <laughs> until I go into blackout mode and then I can kind of like coach the way I want to coach. But it is, I do get some nerves at the beginning. Very so, good. Uh, but thank you, Dan. I appreciate it and appreciate uh, all it. the best. Good man. Thanks.